I mean, it had just not made sense to me that you couldn't subtract five from three. Like, it just didn't make any sense. And then in year two, it was allowed. And so I remember being so relieved <laughs> that this could make sense. G'day and welcome to Mug of Science. It's a pint of science initiative where we bring local scientists to a cafe or club or somewhere nearby to have a chat about their work. My name is Tom Carruthers and I'm here, I've got the, the, the wonderful pleasure to be here with Emeritus Professor Cheryl Prager, who is Emeritus Professor at the University of Western Australia, which also happens to be where we're at. We're at the University of Western Australia Uni Club. Is that correct? That's right. That's yes. correct. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're here to, to chat with Cheryl Prager. She is a fantastic mathematician who does some really, really awesome stuff, but I'll leave that juicy bit for a little bit later in, this, in the episode. Um, but first, to start off Mug of Science, the way we like to start these is to uh, find out what's in your mug this morning. What, what uh, coffee are you having today? Uh, Tom, um, I'm having a flat white. <laughs> A flat white? Yes, I, I love having, you know, milky coffees when I'm out because I can't be bothered doing that at home. Oh, so. it, it is just too much effort when you're at home. Okay. <laughs> um, can we just get like a, a quick snapshot of, of what, what Cheryl Prager's life looks like outside of her academic career? What, is, what do you like oh, doing? Well, as often as I can, I love getting into forests and walking. Um, it's not so easy around here, but we've got a beautiful river and parks, and um, I think maybe we you walk might be able along. To see a bit of yeah. the river over the, the corner. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, I love walking, being in nature. I also love music, um, and I've got lots of things which are perhaps associated with academia, but they're more service activities, which involve mainly looking um, and supporting kids in maths. Um, maths right. challenge activities at school right. and um, like this morning we got the results of the European Girls Mathematics Olympiad and Australia only our I think third or fourth time in participation came 12th which is amazing that and is so cool one of the four girls is from Perth and she won a gold medal so I was extremely proud of her I'm very excited so, so you're you're involved in in a lot of these kind of because um, because I remember I remember there being a math Olympiad when I was in school. Yeah, um, and there wasn't when I was in school, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, I, I imagine there is quite a bit of work that goes into trying to coordinate those things yeah. and, and get like community involvement, schools involvement. It's, it's and a huge like that. national program with um, every state involved and mm -hmm. preparing um, enrichment and challenge activities with kids. It starts off with, say, the Australian maths competition in schools, and then there are more um, challenge and, and enrichment activities through the Australian Maths Trust. And um, that happens statewide. And then once there are kids really, really involved in the program, there are national training programs, which of course has been rather difficult with COVID. A lot of it's happened, to, happened online. Um, but the girl, European Girls Maths Olympiad is a, a new activity running alongside the International Maths Olympiad. And this year, because of the problems of having um, on face-to-face uh, -face training and selection schools, we, we still managed to choose an extremely good team of four girls who were um, announced a few weeks ago and the uh, competition was just this week. Fantastic. Wonderful. So let's let's have just a, a little talk about your your field of expertise, which is mathematics. Mm. Um, specifically in symmetry if I understand correctly, yes. and looking yeah. at like different different symmetry groups. Yeah. Could you perhaps mm. explain when when we're talking about symmetry and groups, what, what they actually what, what they actually what mean, they are? What they are, yeah. Yeah. So I was looking at this square table. Yes. 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 And if we forgot that it had slats this way, we could just turn it a quarter way around, half, three quarters, and the whole way around, and we'd say that's four symmetries that this table's got. Because we can rotate. We can it rotate four it, times. and it looks the same. Would there be another symmetry if it didn't have legs, and we could? If it, flip if it, it didn't have legs, we could rotate, rotate it, it halfway way. around, or we could imagine putting a mirror here and reflecting it. 
right. or a mirror here and reflecting it. Or one that goes or diagonally. One diagonally as well, or and diagonally. diagonally this way. Right. And so for each each one of those would be considered asymmetry. Asymmetry. And you put the symmetries together and you get the group of symmetries. Right. So a, a an object or a something um, that's within a group like this, this space, square, ta table the square table is going to have a similar group to other objects that which could are be square. approximated by a square table or whatever yeah, it might be. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and it depends what you are going to allow as your symmetry. So if you because say, we started by saying, right, so this assume these slats. lights aren't here, yeah. right? So then, was... then you could do it a quarter way around. But you know, if, if you want to preserve the slats, then you have, to, have to go yeah, all the way around in this case. Yeah. But that's assuming that none of the grain in the, the woods there and so yeah, on. So, right, that's right. right. So it depends on what you want, what you're thinking of as squareness. Okay. So if the squareness has the slats or doesn't have the well, squareness doesn't have slats, but <laughs> the table does. Yeah. So so the mathematics um, accommodates all of the constraints you want to put on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so that 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 gives mm. us basically mm. the language and the tools to be able to describe describe it. Yeah. Things. Mm -hmm. So that's our 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 world around us. Yes. But mm -hmm. also things that perhaps we can't. Um, can't necessarily can't imagine. can see in three-dimensional space, but you might want to imagine them. A scientist would imagine accommodating time. So Einstein wanted to accommodate time and space and much more. So being able to effectively come up with a number of uh, groups or, or symmetry groups yeah. that, that describe something like a table, you could then look at another object and do some testing of that object to, to recognize see whether that it looks really like a, a particular group. <laughs> and then yes. you could infer that infer maybe it. it's a table like in its properties or whatever yeah. it might be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and, and that's, that's where it becomes really, really powerful in terms of things you can't necessarily touch or see. Like if I was looking at an atom or a molecule or something like that, mm -hmm. I could start to make potentially some predictions. And then we might have some technology that could help us test them and therefore it, yeah. it makes the model so, stronger and so There's a yeah. wonderful wonderful example, like Crick and Watson, the people that discovered DNA, yeah. they also um, predicted that uh, the, the containers, the capsids for viruses, had what they called an icosahedral symmetry that is, looks like a one of these five-dimensional, I mean, sort of five-fold symmetry things. Yeah. And in those days, there wasn't really much you could do for testing it, but there was uh, the beginning of X-ray um, crystallography. Crystal crystallography or measuring X-ray diffraction patterns. Yes, sorry, yes. And um, they managed to confirm that this was the case, that there were 60 symmetries in the simplest viral capsid. And the reason for suggesting that there would be this symmetry uh, in their terms was um, E, uh, biological economy that the, the virus can reproduce itself and it doesn't have to remember too much right. biological stuff because it has it can just rotate itself around 60 different times and reproduce and itself if, then it, if it just clicks together then great then it's great because yeah. of like okay mm. so use going back to our table for instance if if I was a virus making this, I could make this segment, this, bit of this a, triangle or, here. Or maybe even just that triangle there. Right. And then you would reflect it. And then reflect I could just it, reflect it, reflect it, and then it, reflect it, it, and, and so on. You can just, um, and then, of course, the smaller that part is, the, the less information, less information I have to need. store in the yeah. DNA or RNA of the virus. And so yeah. the idea of having multiple repeating units that go... Right. Yeah. And that's one of the early um, realizations of, of the mathematical symmetry in biology. I mean, yeah. it was always sort of known in geometry, in architecture, and even in the spiral galaxies in space. It was mm. sort of more obvious somehow than in some of the bi biological settings. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, 
because I've seen a couple of the, the photos. Yeah, please, yeah, please have, have a seat. Have a seat. <laughs> um, uh, I've seen a couple of photos of some of the, the beautiful like spirals that you've used in presentations and things yeah. like that as well. The, that, that symmetry. Oh, okay. So here, here's me starting to go, hang on, how does this work? So that's like that spiral that goes out like this. How, yeah. does, how does symmetry end how up? How is that symmetry? Because, because I it's, can't flip it. Or, you can't flip it. So it, it's something that um, sort of goes in one direction or you can reverse it, but it's not a finite thing. Right. So it's a, sort of an infinite symmetry and it's maybe more like a, a trajectory. A, 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 we might call it a semi-group rather than a group because you can't so much reverse it. So the, the big thing about groups is that you can reverse the symmetry. So, and, and in this finite case, you do a rotation quarter of the way around and you only do it four times and you're back where you started. Yeah. Whereas for the Whereas spiral, for spiral you... and, and, and there's a scaling that's happening as well as like yeah. this, the thing gets larger and that's allowed within symmetry groups. Yeah, of scaling. course. Okay. Yeah, it's like calculus. You... Oh, you can just, <laughs> you can just do, do whatever it. you want. <laughs> I'm sure that there's, there's calculus <laughs> mathematicians who are like, you know, you, it's not you just can do everything. No. <laughs> <laughs> Starting the maths wars yeah. right here on Muggle Science. <laughs> Um, but yeah, okay. So the, the, the scaling, but yes, I, I think I see what you're saying. What you're saying is so that what, what you do here you, is a is reflected. You do a bit more and a bit more, a bit bigger as and you go there out. There is no actual yeah. end point because you don't let land where yeah. you started. Except in the real examples, the shell does end; it doesn't go because on it forever. The and the, though, and the plate, point. yes, that's right. Right. So some some of the really interesting things with symmetry are that it gets broken. So Penrose tiling is never exactly um, replicated anywhere, but it looks very beautiful and it, it's subtly symmetric locally, mm. um, but it's not, it's not periodic. You, don't, you can't see one bit repeated and repeated. It's different. And that was a very interesting discovery that uh, was very useful in physics. And, and we've got this Penrose tiling in our um, the floor in the uh, chemistry building, the new chemistry building here oh, at UWA. Right. It's wonderful. <laughs> Have you got any cool little references in buildings anywhere? Has anyone to made me, a building about your mm, work? Well, they no, they've named well, okay. the, they named here, the lecture theatre after me. The lecture <laughs> so someone who's watching, you need to build something <laughs> that references Cheryl's work. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they named Electric the Theatre after you. Is that at UWA? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's that, I guess that's pretty cool. Um, do you want to just give us a little bit of a, uh, a history lesson? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, on your on your little journey through through how you became a mathematician, because I imagine um, that it's. Uh, that it wouldn't have been as straightforward as, for instance, my path to get into chemistry. It... Yeah, maybe not. Yes. So both of my parents left school aged 14 or 15 because their parents were ill or had died and they needed to, to work. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad worked in the bank, so we moved very often. But I remember being in year two, six, seven years old, and discovered that negative numbers were illegal. I mean, it had just not made sense to me that you couldn't subtract five from three. Like, it just didn't make any sense. And then in year two, it was allowed. And so I remember being so relieved <laughs> that this could make sense. And then when I started doing science, I was very skeptical of anything that was claimed. Like I, I heard about mirror images and I thought, no, there's no image. And what are they talking about? And then we did this experiment and you looked through the mirror and you did some measurements. And I eventually decided I would believe in mirror images. <laughs> so you were convinced. So I was you convinced. You saw enough evidence to be convinced that mirror and images existed. Seemed, and it seemed like every bit of science was explained by something in mathematics. And mathematics seemed to be the basis, the fundamental of it all. And I started to be very, very interested in it. I, I found it pretty scary because you had to work really hard and you might get questions in an exam which would be 
not so easy to solve. So I didn't find maths easy in that sense. I found it terrifying, but easy in another sense. It, it all made sense to me. So I wanted to, I wanted to study mathematics. But no one in my family had ever been to university. They hadn't finished school even. And right. that was still an issue that I would be allowed to finish school. So I was only allowed to finish school on the grounds that maybe I would go to a business college afterwards and catch up on the skills I'd missed out on, the commercial skills. But because I, you would have been I would have been doing into... maths and science and no room for typing and shorthand and bookkeeping. Right. But I was allowed to finish school and then um, then I thought I really wanted to study maths at university. So I tried to get what information we could to say, well, how do you study maths at university? And I, and I was actually put off by a government vocational guidance officer who said that girls don't do maths, they don't pass, and there aren't any jobs anyway. All of which is false. Yeah. But I found out more advice from the University of Queensland, uh, the University of Queensland, and was able to, to study, which was fantastic. I, I, I loved it, I found it scary, that just the, the, the change from school to university with no, no one to tell me it's gonna be all right. Mm. Um, uh, but it was, it was great. But then by second year, I was the only girl in my advanced mathematics units, and I was still doing honor, uh, the sort of advanced honors units in physics as well and there was a second girl there in second year but you know there was it was pretty lonely I had to become an honorary guy yeah but the big yeah. a big um, watershed was getting a, a, a scholarship one summer vacation to the Australian National University in Canberra and uh, seeing mathematicians doing research projects and being given my own little research project which worked and I published my first paper from that experience and I happened to have the opportunity of sitting in on lectures at a summer research institute at the Australian Math Society which coincidentally happened during the period I was in Canberra and thought oh this is what I want to do I so much want to do a PhD in mathematics um, and I really want to do it in category theory because that's going to um, unify all of mathematics and it's going to change the world but <laughs> well I didn't work in category theory but you know I, I just became passionately um, sure that that's what I wanted to do next I think, for I think as long those, as I could yeah so, <laughs> so so those kind of experiences are so important right mm, um, yes with like you were describing right now of going into that summer program but you were you were exposed to what the what the what, breadth of this world that yes. you had only been tangentially touching and on the so community far. and the culture and yeah yeah no it's it's a so important those kinds of programs to be able to capture the the passion and the and interest the, and, and the vision the and the uh, you know the imagination that something might be possible yeah definitely <laughs> I think well. I think it's important to 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 add into this 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 line that it wasn't just that you were doing this summer project and mm. that you were the only girl in the math class. You were also absolutely killing it in terms of doing really really well. Yes, I got right? the university medal for mathematics right. when I graduated my honors. Which can degree. also can contribute to that sense of loneliness a little bit as well, no? Or was it that you were well, competing with a bunch of I other people? Actually, I felt very guilty because by the time I was doing my honors year, there were eight of us. I was the only girl, of course, and I desperately wanted to get a scholarship so I could do my PhD. Mm. And I felt it was almost unworthy that I wanted to get better than everybody else because that was the wrong motivation for a girl. <laughs> I mean, I know, knew I wanted to be really, really good, but I knew I wanted to win the scholarship. And it seemed like it was unworthy. It wasn't a pure enough reason for yeah. you to be. <laughs> but I did know that I wanted to go. <laughs> How very mathematician of you to be like, you know, my motivation isn't pure enough here. <laughs> I was like, like so that's that's just serious, Arab, right? Is that the mathematicians tell off all the other scientists for not being accurate or pure enough in their work, um, and this is actually your experience, and you're critiquing yourself. Um, 
<laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so, so I did get the scholarship to Oxford and that was wonderful. And I was introduced to the mathematics of symmetry there because I, I'd only done lots and lots of different areas of um, coursework as, as a, an undergraduate student. And it was only in, in Oxford that I really met groups. I'd done a little bit through my master's program before I went to Oxford. I'd learned about, something about groups. Um, but then through my doctorate, I just, I just fell in love with symmetry. <laughs> symmetry is beautiful. So then you eventually made your way back. Yeah, I came back straight away. I, I wasn't quite ready to come back, but I'd signed a form that said I would come back. Right. And I, um, I got a three year research fellowship at the Australian National University, which was great because that had been where I would have liked to have done my PhD if I hadn't had the chance to go overseas. Yes. And two weeks after I started my research fellowship, I got offered a, a six month visiting assistant lectureship at the University of Virginia. And they gave me, after two weeks, they said, yep, sure, you can have a six month leave without pay. So I went to the University of Virginia where they had a special group theory semester. Extremely exciting, like every week someone, some group theorists came in from somewhere in the States and gave a lecture and, and I you know, started working with other people. Uh, that was fun. Yeah. And then I came back uh, to my research fellowship. Um, met John who was studying statistics, we got married, he was doing his PhD in Canberra and there were no jobs anywhere. So um, So in a way kind of that government vocation. He was right, was maybe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but there were there were yes. jobs you went So on our honeymoon when we were at separate conferences as you do. Because <laughs> this is how you This is how you do, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> You go to we your went, conference, honey, I'll go to mine. <laughs> and someone said, there are these four jobs at the University of Western Australia, two for one year, two for two years, but unfortunately the application dates passed. So I thought, oh gosh. So I wrote this letter saying, my husband and I would like to apply for these jobs and when we get home from our honeymoon, we will send you our CVs, which is on the <laughs> records of this university. <laughs> so <laughs> we... <laughs> Wow. So in the end, we came here. I had a two-year job. They bent those and they rules. And for John you. had a one-year job. Cool. And we thought, I thought we'd just be here one or two years, depending. Well, it's but we, been a few more than yeah, one or two years, yeah, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very young. I was the second woman to be professor at an Australian university. Second professor of mathematics, of mathematics. Of mathematics. Of mathematics, yeah. And probably it only worked because we didn't have to relocate in the situation with such young kids. And right. that. So, you know, we didn't ever plan to stay here, but we did. And it's been very, very well, good. This, this became home, right? Yeah, it did, yes. Uh, thank, thank you for, for yeah. showing that, that, that journey. Um, um, and there's, there's of course more that, that, that happens after that, yes. which, which is where you get recognised for um, yeah. the contributions that you've made to mathematics. You're an elected a fellow of the Australian Academy, Academy of Science. Of Science. Um, yeah. you've I, got I really, uh, uh, that was the AM, that is, yep. yes. And, um, and now um, I will get the AC in a few weeks when I travel to Canberra, yes. <laughs> Which means you get to get rid of that and put on a new one, don't you? Yeah. It's a slightly different one. Um, so yeah, and mm. congratulations for those those things being uh, recognised, um, thank you, earned and recognised. Um, and I think I think that it is uh, wonderful for mathematics. I mean, mathematics is kind of invisible. It's so important in everything, mm. but you you see the sexy things and you don't see the mathematics so often, and. I, I think it's just important, you know, these computers, these cameras, they just rely on the mathematical algorithms and which make them work. There was also PM's Prize for Science as well, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, now that was amazing. That was the end of 2019. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I was the first person working in Western Australia that ever won that. Yeah. And it was 20 years of the PM's Prize before that happened. So that was, yeah. that was astounding. 
to, for it to go to pure mathematics again. That was great. And so wonderful that it's also for, for women as well as men and there's a role for women. I mean, there's so many layers in which it was a lovely experience. Um, yeah. So you don't, you don't get awarded uh, the Penn's Prize of Science. You don't get given an AC. You don't get a fellowship to the Australian Academy of Science if you haven't done something that has made a huge impact. I'm just wondering if you might be able to potentially find a few words to think about what your work may have done for my mum who might be watching this um, <laughs> or or the, the, the society as a, as a whole. How, how, have you, how have you impacted how my have, life without oh me my knowing? Gosh. Yes. <laughs> I, it's really hard to know with mathematics how it's been going to be used in the future. But the, the sort of work I've done um, really um, introduced new methods and new ways of of um, analysing symmetric structures and then new algorithms for making computers act super fast if they were studying symmetry, which computers do sometimes. Um, and they are, and the work of some of my students are looking at codes for encoding, sort of adding error correction to to um, to, 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 to sort of communication codes in in new ways. Um, but it, this, uh, so I've been using the finite simple group classification, which classifies the building blocks of symmetry. And that was like a watershed result in the 1980s, really only pinned down maybe 2011 when the last papers and books were published. But we were using it from then on. And it changed the way mathematics in my area was conducted mm -hmm. and I was lucky to be in the first few people who were sorting out how to use it and how to study the internal structure of these simple groups and how to um, then apply it, how to work out what new fundamental theory was needed in order to um, study and analyse networks, the sort of networks that you might use for communicating across the world. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, there's two different sides of this. One is the encryption, so you stop the wrong people reading it. Mm -hmm. And the other is robustness, so you send a, you send a spaceship into space and you want that spaceship to send back pictures that you can reassemble and view on Earth. And you want to know and you, whether or not you you've want got to the full add, set of information. You want to add some extra error correction capability, you want to add some redundancy right. so that when when you get the stuff back and it's not quite what was sent, you can say, aha, the only thing, the only other message that that's a, a true message from this gobbledygook that I've got is this one, so I'll correct it this way. And right. so it's so adding that redundancy in a special way, in a symmetrical way that you are very likely to be able to correct it. So that, right, that's, that's code, yeah, that's yeah, encoding yeah. stuff. Which does speed up communications as which, well because you don't, they, have to, you don't have to resend stuff. You don't resend it um, and you can correct it. Yeah. And you often don't have the uh, extra opportunity of correcting if it's come if from it's Mars. From Mar yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't realised that, that, that symmetry and would have an impact in that space. So, it, it's, so you, you sort of imagine you're in a multi-dimensional space and there are so many things which might be message you might interpret as a message but you you want to sort of space out the messages so that they're not too close and so you imagine and each right. message is a string of zeros and ones because you can go on off on off electronically yeah. yeah and so this is a message and that's a message and you send it back and the sunburst hits it and destroys this one so it's sort of moving that message away from itself so what you get back isn't a valid message it's something else but you say, ah, oh, it's closer to that one than anyone else, so I can correct it. So it's trying to do that in a smart way, which is the which is the, the code. Which is the code, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, so very, very cool. And I and, and I know that that was a bit of a rough question originally because it's really hard to say well, what you what, what's, what the what's impact really of your work is. is. <laughs> um, but what I'm yeah. what I'm hearing yeah. here is 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 not not only 
are there are there like direct impacts that you've made on people's lives and work mm. by providing or assisting with extra tools? You've effectively you've enabled, enabled a huge world yes. of mathematics to exist yes. um, in a much more efficient way and in a more powerful way. Um, and from there, mm. then there's the discovery yeah. that might have a, a practical Im impact yes. or whatever. Yes, I mean it might things, be. things are starting like that. There's, there's these power line communications you want to be able to have zillions of in um, z zillions of different people communicating at the same time you know, through the one through the cable. one cable which like the okay, yeah. right, the power lines and that are already power line sort through of thing, the whole they're always ready there right. you want to repurpose make use them, of that technology that's already, them. Yeah, the, yeah. the infrastructure that's already there and why why so, another cable yeah, that's already another one one of my PhD one. students is sort of seeing the, the consequences of his work or our work um, in, in working out the kinds of codes which you might be able to use in, the, in that application. Very cool. Which is nice, yeah. Very cool. Do you think you can have a, like a punt in the dark as to, to what might be the kinds of things that people will use your work for in 20 well, years or 50 years? time what, what what would you what would you like to see them do where's the next step oh, I'd like to see better service through communications for for everyone in the regions not just in the cities and so I'd, I don't know whether some of these new methods would be so applicable that it would be cheap it would be effective it would just work to make to make a more equitable society so that we could have people in any in any place uh, to have the same um, abilities to access all because the facilities the we for, do. The copper yeah. for the electricity does run, run yeah, first. Or, or it might go through the, through the satellites or it might, who knows? I mean, there, there'll be technology, but the mathematics will also help with the technology and I hope I hope the solutions will come <laughs> I think I think that's actually a, a really nice place to, to round off because what I'm what I'm hearing through your story of uh, your education as you you came through schooling and through your university studies before um, eventually yeah. having your chair as professor here mm -hmm. at UWA um, and your work outside of your academic work, where you're where you're supporting programs like the Maximum um, Pied for, yeah. for girls and, and and those other things, and what you've just described of bringing bringing access to people who don't yeah. necessarily have access, mm -hmm. um, this it, this sounds as though it's it's a life dedicated to equity. Um, yes. And I actually I think that's a it's a it's a lovely legacy to be able to leave mm. behind potentially the tool to continue that work. Um, I wish that I would be able to have that kind of impact myself. So uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Tom. Just for the final question. To me, a scientist is someone who dot dot dot. To me, a scientist is someone who is passionately wanting to understand the world and and works and works towards that in their in their whole life <laughs> um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you so thank you once again and thank yes. you for joining us at mug of science uh, keep tuned for the next episode whenever that happens to go out um, and uh, happy pint of science festival <laughs>